All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Mary, and I work at Tata Cover Bookstore, Colorado's largest independent bookstore. Um, we would not be here without you, truly. 2021 is Tata Cover's 50th anniversary, and we owe our longevity to the readers who support us. We're expanding quite a bit with new stores at McGregor Square, right by Coors Field, and a children's store at Stanley Marketplace in Aurora. Before I go any further, I want to inform you that closed captioning is available on this video for those who might want it or need it. There is a black bar at the bottom of the screen with a button labeled CC on it. Click that button and closed captioning is available should you want it or need it. Please check out tatteredcover.com slash event for more virtual author events. Um, tomorrow night, we have Maggie Smith discussing her book, Golden Rod. Check out tatteredcover.com for more info. Um, and now I'll introduce our two guests for the evening. I am excited to introduce Anne McCutcheon and Martha Ackman, the authors of The Life She Wished to Live, a biography of Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings and These Fevered Days, 10 Pivotal Moments in the Making of Emily Dickinson. Anne McCutcheon is the author of Marcel Moy's Voice of the Flute, the muse that sings, composers speak about the creative process, Circular Breathing, Meditations from a Musical Life, River Music, An Atfalia Story, and Where's the Moon? A Memoir of the Space Coast and the Florida Dream. Her sixth book, The Life She Wished to Live, a biography of Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings, author of The Yearling, will be released May 11, 2021, by W.W. Norton. As well, she is a busy lyricist and libertist with eight commissioned works the newest is The Dreamer, an opera based on the original story with composer Mark Allen Taggart, to be premiered online by the East Carolina University Opera Studio in May of 2021. Martha Ackman is a journalist and author who writes about women who have changed America. Her essays have appeared in the Atlantic Monthly, Paris Review, the New York Times, and the Washington Post. She is also a frequent commentator for New England Public Radio, and has been featured on CNN, National Public Radio, and the BBC. Martha's award-winning books include The Mercury 13, The True Story of 13 Women and the Dream of Space Flight, Curveball, The Remarkable Story of Tony Stone, First Woman to Play Professional Baseball in the Negro League, and These Fevered Days, 10 Pivotal Moments in the Making of Emily Dickinson. A theatrical adaptation of Curveball premiered off Broadway in 2019. Tony Stone, written by playwright Lydia Diamond, was a New York Times critic's pick, and the Wall Street Journal named it the best new play of 2019. Please welcome Martha and Anne, who will unmute their cameras and join us now. Hi. Uh, Hi, Anne. Hi, Martha. Hello, Martha. Books. Nice to be with you all. <laughs> Glad to be here. And I don't know, you wanna go first for um, uh, explaining and talking about your book a little bit and I'll chime in later and then we can have a conversation. That sounds great. Um, I thought it best to uh, read a few paragraphs of the introduction to my book. Uh, many people have uh, heard of The Yearling um, as a, a novel that won the Pulitzer Prize uh, in 1939. A movie was made of it. Um, it it's a book that many people still read and uh, is often misidentified as a children's book. Um, it's an adult novel, and uh, despite the fact that there's a 12-year-old boy in the, in the center of it. Um, so I'll just read uh, a little bit about it, um, the introduction of the book. I first heard about Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings from my fourth grade teacher at McNam Elementary in Pompano Beach, Florida. It was early spring and Miss Chapman, a Florida native, decided it was a good time to share Rawlings' best known novel, The Yearling, with 29-year-olds. Every day after lunch for weeks, she read aloud a few pages, inviting the class to listen for the author's beautiful sentences and the backwoods Florida world they brought to life. All of us, Northern transplants whose families had been lured to the state by the post-war boom were entranced by this story, delivered during that delicious drowsiness following milk and sandwiches by an old timer whose voice was as soft and suggestive as distant radio waves. 
The yearling was our first impression of old Florida. The people's speech and traditions and Mrs. Chapman's reading seemed a private thing, a gift from her to us. We didn't know that the book, a coming of age story about a boy, his pet deer and his parents who farmed the North Central Florida scrub had been the best-selling novel of 1938. Nor did we know the book had won the Pulitzer Prize and had been translated into 29 languages or that Metro Golden Mayor had made a popular film of it starring Gregory Peck, Peck and Jane Wyman. All of this before we were born. By the time Mrs. Chapman read it to us, The Yearling had come to be thought of as a children's book because it's centered on a young boy and it was a staple of the elementary school story hour. Uh, that's, that's how I came to read The Yearling. That's how I uh, came to know Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings at first. Um, but I, I later, as, as a young adult, read most of the rest of her work and uh, fell in love with it. In, in 2014, I was offered the opportunity to write um, Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings' biography, and uh, I, I was delighted to. I went right at it and uh, uh, spent several years, <laughs> here we are in 2021, with a, with a book just out, uh, researching and writing that book. What I loved about Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings was the fact that she, um, she set up to do something she really wanted to do and she did it. She was in many ways a woman ahead of her time. She wanted to be a literary writer. She started um, as, as a freelance journalist like a lot of writers do, um, writing articles for magazines, um, PR material and so forth. But in 1928, she um, took a gamble and bought a farm in, uh, in Florida, central Florida and moved down with her first husband to supposedly raise oranges and, and write. And they would make a living by selling oranges and, and have all this writing time. Didn't quite work out that way. A northerner coming to the South uh, always is surprised <laughs> at how hard it can be to live there even now. Um, so my journey of writing about Marjorie was of discovering what she was discovering um, in the backwoods of Florida and, and how um, hard it can be to write uh, when you're practically penniless <laughs> and uh, how hard it is to find friends, um, contacts with whom you can share your work. She ultimately did that in, in, in a big way. Um, so I'll stop here and, and Martha, why don't you make an introduction and, and we'll go from there. Well, it's, it's interesting uh, to me, Anne, that, that both of our books began in, um, in classrooms. Um, you, you listening to your, your teacher read and, and uh, mine began in a classroom as well, Slight, slightly different situation. I've studied at Emily Dickinson all, all my adult life, um, graduate school, that, that sort of thing. And um, yet, and always wanted to do a biography of Dickinson, but never knew exactly how. Um, I didn't want to write what is called a cradle to grave biography that that had been done. Uh, it didn't interest me in, in treading that ground again. And for, um, for about 20 years, I, I taught a seminar on Emily Dickinson in the Dickinson Museum in Amherst, Massachusetts. I was a Mount Holyoke College professor and my students could come over the notch as, as we say and study Dickinson in her room, which was really quite an extraordinary experience. And I noticed that when I wrap the day's lesson around a particular moment in Dickinson's life, students seem to understand her better. They, they seem to, um, to get her in a, in a way that was um, deeper, richer than other approaches I had taken. So I, I remember walking home one day and saying, I think I've got it, you know, I think I have the, the conceit here that if my students seem to be interested um, in, in studying Dickinson through the lens of one day that maybe a wider audience would as well. So, um, so that's how uh, the, the conceit for the book began. Um, how did I pick the, the 10 days? Well, 10 was a uh, an even number. <laughs> it, was, it was just a, a rather random choice. I, I'm a big believer in books that are about 250, 300 pages long. So I thought that that, that would fit the bill. And, um, and I did want to give a sense of the literary sweep of Dickinson's life. So I wanted one day fairly early on, I wanted to kind of progress through her life. 
So the 10 days that I chose were chronological, but they weren't consecutive. And I wanted them to be specific days, not just um, autumn 1864, for example. I wanted it to be uh, an actual day that you could pinpoint on the, the calendar where, uh, where something, um, where, where something happened, where um, uh, did I lose us here. You're here. I'm here. All right. You're here. I see you. <laughs> um, I uh, okay. All right. Um, I was getting a, some kind of a up, update or something. Um, uh, so um, so I wanted to have a day where something happened in Dickinson's life where she was di different at. 10 o'clock at night, say, than she was at, at, at 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, and so there were some uh, obvious ones that you had to choose. Emily Dickinson, as, as I'm sure most of um, our listeners, our, our viewers know, was a poet who lived in the 19th century. She published very rarely only a handful of poems in her lifetime. All of her work, the, the bulk of it was discovered af after her death um, in uh, 1886. And um, so I knew that I wanted to hit um, the days when one of those handful of poems was first published. I knew I wanted to choose a day when she reached out to a, um, uh, an essayist at the Atlantic Monthly and shared her poems for the first time. I wanted to have the, the day when he came to visit. But the rest, um, I, I asked my friends, other Dickinson scholars about. And, uh, and it was kind of a great parlor game to use a 19th century <laughs> phrase for us to think about, well, how about this day or how about that day? Uh, many people um, suggested a, a day when Dickinson's great dog that she had, one of the great loves of her life, a big shaggy dog named Carlo. Most people think he was in Newfoundland when he came into her life. And I love that idea, but we didn't know. We didn't know when the day was. So I kind of tossed that out. So eventually I, I settled on, on my, my 10 days and then went to work. Um, I live uh, not far from where Emily Dickinson spent most of her days. And uh, as I said, I taught a class for almost 20 years in the Dickinson Museum. So I had wonderful uh, friends and contacts that I could call upon to help uh, uh, bring a, a vividness to the book. Um, I write in the style of narrative nonfiction. That means bringing the techniques of storytelling to tell a true story. Um, if you say the sky is blue, you better have a weather report to back it up. <laughs> so um, so I, I was uh, very fortunate to have the um, uh, access to the, to the Dickinson Museum, um, of course, to her papers, uh, half of which are at Amherst College, uh, roughly half the other half at, at Harvard University. And so to just give you an idea, for example, um, I have uh, one chapter in the book when Dickinson came back home to Amherst. Uh, you notice I'm not using the H, that, that's the way that locals pronounce it. It looks like it's, it's spelled Amherst, but uh, locals, and right. perhaps Dickinson, we don't really have a record of that pronounced at Amherst. Um, Dickinson suffered from eye problems and she had to go to Boston to, to uh, be treated by a, a physician there, a very prominent eye doctor there. And she came back home after that, that treatment, really fearing that she might lose her eyesight. And the first thing she wanted to do was to read Shakespeare because she had been pre prevented from reading books. So she went up to the attic of, of the house and opened up um, her volume of Shakespeare and read at the top of her lungs. We know this because there's a, a letter that talks about it. And so I called up my friends at the museum and said, can I get up here again? I get in the attic and I see what the light looks like. Can I read a little Shakespeare and see how it sounds? You know, wasn't exactly the same, the acoustics as they were uh, during Dickinson's time, but I think pretty close. So, so it was those kinds of, um, that, that kind of immediacy uh, and, and sense of detail that I, I really wanted to bring to the book. Um, so um, I think that's about all I wanna say at this point. I don't know, I, I can do a little bit of a reading or um, uh, or we might chat. Do you have any? I, I have a response. Um, what you talked about being, um, 
uh, close to Emily Dickinson, um, you know, in close proximity, uh, not to her, but to, to, to her world for a long time. And uh, I could say the same uh, for myself, uh, for Marjorie, in that I grew up in, in Central Florida. I don't live there now. Um, when the opportunity came to, to write her biography, I knew right where I was going. <laughs> um, back to Central Florida and the world of the orange groves. And I had been to her home, um, but I had not been to Marjorie's uh, archive at the University of Florida, which um, contains more than 4,000 letters, for example, and all of her drafts and uh, quite a treasure trove. In fact, when I contacted the archivist there, uh, Flo Turcott, uh, I first spoke with her on the phone and said, I'd like to write, you know, I think I'm gonna write this book. And she said, ah, come to Gainesville, it's one-stop shopping. And in many ways it was, uh, there was a lot of material. So like you, I had access to um, uh, you know, sources, um, paper and non-paper. Um, for me, I did have a few uh, personal interviews with people who had known Marjorie as children and, and two of them are no longer with us. So it's interesting what, what our materials are, what do we have when in our hands um, you, we're both dealing, have been dealing with women who are no longer among us, but of different centuries. And uh, the resources are, have been different, haven't they? Yes, um, I, I think I spent some of the happiest moments of my life in archives, not only for this, this Dickinson project, but for other projects as well. And, and I'm, I'm interested in what you had to say and about one-stop shopping. Of course, it never it turns out to be never. that way. <laughs> a, a line will take you, you know, you'll read a letter and that'll provoke some kind of uh, interest and you'll take it another place. Exactly. Uh, one experience that I, that I had in archives researching um, uh, Dickinson's life, and I, I'd be interested to hear what you have to say. Emily Dickinson, you know, many people think of as America's greatest literary recluse. Um, mm -hmm. From the time she was in her mid-30s, she began you know, closing the door, not, not seeing mm -hmm. people. Um, and yet, uh, for, for being identified that way, she has one of the biggest paper trails around. Um, and so I found myself waiting in material a lot and things that I wanted to say, details that I wanted to put in. I know I kept a file called dailiness that I mm -hmm. consulted whenever I kind of wanted to get a sense of the texture of the household and it included food she liked and her, her sister's favorite apple and when the wallpaper changed and things like that. And yet I, I, I found that, um, and maybe this is kind of a writers talking about writing here, you and I, but um, I found that what I ended up doing was cutting all the time. Oh, that I needed, I needed to maintain the focus. And mm -hmm. so it was, it was heartbreaking for me, the ones to tell everybody everything about Emily Dickinson to toss things out. Did you have a similar experience? Oh yes. <laughs> um, you know, my book is, you could say it's cradle to grave, um, but it's, it's, um, it, it had to be episodic. The chapters had to be a, a, a specific focus or, or, would, uh, or, or would be as big as the Encyclopedia Britannica. Um, I found that I had to cut characters, um, um, people who were important to her, but who, uh, whose correspondence or records with her did not add uh, more than you know, some more important people already had provided. Um, I, I think where I got bogged down was, uh, especially in the last few chapters, which I had to, to cut, uh, it, it hurt me. I, I had to listen to Bach the whole time. Bach makes me cut, um, Bach makes me edit. So, <laughs> but I was so interested in what she read and in her letters to friends, they discussed books and uh, I could tell where you know, her, her mind was being influenced by a particular author or a particular uh, subject or issue. And I just wanted to put it all in, but I couldn't. And so the, um, probably the hardest uh, cutting was, was re with regard to that. That could be another book. Maybe five people would be interested in it too. <laughs> <laughs> you always have to keep your audience in mind. Yes, yes you do. <laughs>
You know, and we're writing about obviously very di different women in, in different centuries. And, and yet I think there are a lot of commonalities and I think ambition might, might be one of those things. Um, two different stripes of ambition. But one of, the, one of the points I tried to get across in my book that I thought was kind of a new take on Dickinson had to do with her ambition. And um, one, of the, one of the days in the book, um, uh, is a, uh, a, a fall afternoon when Dickinson is writing to her cousin and she's recalling uh, a moment, a visit they had had earlier when she writes, do you remember that October morning when you and I in the dining room decided to be distinguished? It's a great thing to yes. be great, she said. And and I, I think that's a, a kind of a new slant on, on Dickinson that uh, that people often find confusing that they think that because she didn't publish, she didn't want to, she was misunderstood by um, uh, the, the, the editors of the day. And that simply was not true. She, it, it wasn't so much that she didn't want to publish as in my judgment, she never wanted to let anything go. <laughs> Writing was always alive as, as long as she was working on it. But that didn't mean that she, didn't have ambition, that, that she didn't seek fame on her own terms at mm -hmm. her own time. And it certainly didn't mean if, if we look at the historical record that editors, um, uh, the ones that she had communicated with were um, enthralled by her work, wanted more um, uh, that, that she often put the brakes on. But uh, I, I, I think this is a, uh, it, it's the uh, decided feminist in me. I think that that wants to say loud and clear that women have ambition. You know that 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 women have uh, big big dreams, and sometimes like Emily Dickinson that we often uh, misunderstand and misjudge. Was right. it uh, a similar situation for you? Um, not quite. Um, uh, Marjorie was ambitious. Um, as, a, as a young girl, as a, uh, you know, a 12 year old, for example, writing her first pieces, or her mother was ambitious for her. Her mother wanted a daughter of note. And so when dancing school didn't work and vo vocal lessons, um, somehow a writing talent emerged at an early time and her mother um, pushed her. And so um, as a young woman, you know, of 13 or 14 might say, oh, my mom thinks I'm great. Everybody thinks I'm great. I got published in the Washington Post. Um, I'll go ahead and do this, but but she got to college and she realized that the stuff she was writing was just sentimental stuff that would show up in a ladies magazine and make everybody proud, um, certain people proud. <laughs> um, and, and it was a college professor who said, get rid of the adjectives and, and all the flowery language and the sentimental plots. And, uh, and she just snapped too, she, she got it. And uh, with her study of literature at the University of Wisconsin and her reading, she then became very ambitious for herself. And it's no secret, as in all her letters, um, uh, she wanted to be a literary writer. First, a poet. <laughs> she, she, wanted, she wrote a great deal of poetry um, as a student and, and then uh, began to write stories. And eventually, uh, when she got to Florida, she could write literary uh, stories and novels. That was after 10 or so years of working in the trenches as a publicist and a newspaper writer and, uh, and dealing with a husband who was jealous of her male editors. There was that. Um, there are a lot of struggles. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a feminist story in that life, um, mm -hmm. no doubt. Yeah. So. You, you, you mentioned family, and certainly you can't do a biography of anyone without talking about family and friends. Are, are, there, are there some overarching points that, that you discovered about the family she came from and the family she created? Sure. Um, her parents are both from the Midwest. Um, they, they grew up on farms. Uh, her father, um, uh, went to law school uh, eventually in Washington, D.C. He wanted to make a good living. Uh, they, the two, her parents, worked as school teachers in, in the Midwest and then in Texas for a, a strange two years, then went to Washington, D.C. To, to make it. And, uh, and there um, uh, she was born, their, their, their daughter was born. Um, so there was an ambition, especially with her mother in the, in the Washington, D.C. 
um, you know, uh, soup, <laughs> if you will, in the early 20th century and um, ambitious for her daughter, for herself. Um, her husband was not so ambitious and that he, he wanted to make a good living, but he also wanted to go back to the farm. And he, he was uh, very sensitive to his daughter's appreciation for the outdoors. So it was her, her mother who pu pushed her in, in often uh, uncomfortable ways, um, but, her, but her father's heart was in her and with her. He died young, but she always spoke of him as the one who inspired her. So those, those two parents, she had a brother, a younger brother who um, didn't make out so well in life and with whom she took care of on and off um, until she died, sending him money, rescuing his, um, his son and so forth. But that, that was the family unit, the parents and the, the daughter who would succeed and the son who, well, he didn't. <laughs> um, so, and, and there she often would speak uh, later in life of how she was descended from Dutch people and German people, but that's, that's extraneous. It was that family unit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. What about you? Um, Emily, got lots of them on Emily. Dickinson <laughs> <laughs> uh, came from a family of of privilege. Um, her, uh, Amherst is a little, little town, was a smaller town when, when she lived here from 1830 to 1886. Um, but the family was prominent. Um, uh, her father was a, a lawyer, um, served one term in Congress. Um, Emily Dickinson visited him there. This was in the 1850s and the run up to the, to mm -hmm. the Civil War. It's kind of astonishing to think of Emily Dickinson being in Washington, D.C., in Philadelphia and, and, and Boston, but she had experience with older cities, um, uh, major cities, I, I should say. And uh, uh, her mother, um, Dickinson once wrote a letter that said, mother ne never cared for thought. And that has sort of written her off, unfortunately, and it shouldn't be. Um, uh, I, I, I tend to think that she wasn't really talking about thought meaning thinking and intellectual ideas. She might've been more precisely talking about poetry when she said mm -hmm. that, but uh, Dickinson's mother had an extraordinary education for the time. She um, went away to school in New Haven where she took classes in chemistry at, at Yale. Uh, Emily Dickinson had a, a fine education herself and went to Mount Holyoke Female Seminary. Mm -hmm. um, uh, which was kind of analogous to college at, at the time. So, um, so she did have a privilege, not wealth, but uh, comfort. And, mm -hmm. and in, a, uh, in a family that valued education mm -hmm. profoundly. Mm -hmm. um, when I taught my seminar on Emily Dickinson, I used to spend the first class meeting by taking my students on a three hour walking tour of Emily Dickinson's Amherst because she, she lived just a couple of blocks from the center of town and we could see a lot of things. And, and uh, one of the things I always pointed out was once we got uh, to the center of town, I'd ask my students to turn around in 360 degrees and, and uh, look for the highest point in town. And they would do that. And, and in New England, the highest point is usually where you'd find a white congregational church. Um, but not in Amherst. You find the highest point of land is Amherst College. <laughs> and that, that says everything about the town she grew up and her family, I think, that uh, in terms of value, education, a life of the mind yes. uh, was enormously important. And my goodness, that helped Emily Dickinson. She had an older brother, Austin, who married her best friend. They had three children. She had a younger sister, Lavinia, Vinnie. Um, both Emily and Vinnie did not marry. Brother Austin moved right next door with, with his family. And I think probably if, if you were to ask me what, what is the most important gift the family gave Emily Dickinson, I would say they left her alone. Uh -huh. um, that they did not push her into social situations where she'd meet eligible young men. They did not force marriage. Uh, she would often work late at night. The family knew she was writing. Um, upon her death, uh, when her younger sister went into a room to clear out her effects, she was, I think, uh, quite surprised to find out how much she had been writing. Um, so the family gave her that, that 
that latitude. So uh, uh, comfort, um, education, uh, and, and a family that respects each other. Her younger sister, Lavinia, once said this sentence that I always think is so apt for understanding Emily Dickinson's world. She said of her family, we were all proud and independent monarchs. <laughs> I, I like that a lot, you know, strong individuals, <laughs> but also uh, independent, giving each other space. Yeah, yeah, I like that. <laughs> Marjorie had to, to make her space for herself. She, you know, uh, that's why she just went off the deep end and, and uh, got a, uh, an orange grove in the middle of nowhere. And, uh, and she was a businesswoman. She, she had to be to make that orange grove go. But it was, uh, as the title indicates, the life she wished to live. She wanted to be, have a writing life and have um, a place of her own to do it. The, her, she was married twice. Um, this is telling her first husband was her college um, uh, boyfriend. And he also wanted to be a writer. And uh, it was all, always a tempestuous young love sort of marriage. He was very jealous of her. He was sometimes on the road as a traveling salesman for a while and suspected she was having affairs with her editors or whoever. Um, and uh, she actually quit a very good job just to uh, assuage that and uh, uh, so on. Um, but, but when she got to Florida <clears throat> uh, and the marriage broke, very, as soon as her first novel came out and was uh, a big success, uh, the marriage was over. <laughs> um, and, and she waited a while, some years, and, and married a man with whom she could have a sort of a weekend marriage. Um, he was a hotel um, operator in St. Augustine. She was in Cross Creek, um, some 70 miles away. And uh, so she would be writing there during the week and he'd be at, at the hotel and they would often you know, meet on the weekends. And he would drive her to say, North Carolina for a month when she wanted to have a retreat mm -hmm. by herself. He'd drive her up with her pets and then come back and get her at the end of the summer. Um, and that's one reason there's so much correspondence between the two of them, um, because they wrote and wrote and wrote. Uh, they kept in touch almost daily. Uh, but that was, a, that was how she got that privacy. You know, letters are so enormously important. You mentioned letters and, and uh, this is a little off topic, but you know, one has to think about what kind of biographies will be written about our generation when we're, mm -hmm. when we're using email and it disappears into the ether or you delete it wrongly, you know, all that kind of thing. Letters right. are so very important. Just to share um, one, uh, one little story about our mutual editor. <laughs> we had the same <laughs> editor at, at, at Norton. Um, I submitted a, a chapter, a first draft of a, of a chapter, and uh, it had to do with Dickinson and the Civil War. Dickinson lived right in the midst of the Civil War, obviously, her father being a politician. Politics was very much discussed uh, in the Dickinson homestead. And um, I had a chapter about the first soldier death, the first young man from Amherst, uh, uh, I should say one of the first, who, who was killed in the Civil War, the one that had the most profound effect. He was the son of the Amherst College uh, president. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, Amherst College education is everything in, in our little town here. And so it had a very big impact. And the chapter was filled with um, action. Yeah. I, I, I think, uh, I think, I'm a big believer in it's a re responsibility of a writer to get the reader to turn the page. You know, you have to keep a, a reader engaged. So it was filled with, with action and, and battles and this young man's death, a death that, that caused her uh, shortly afterwards to submit her first poems to the editor of the, uh, to an essayist at the Atlantic that I mentioned earlier. Well, I turned that chapter into my editor, our editor. Mm -hmm. And she said, hmm, Martha, not exactly what I thought. <laughs> uh -huh. And you know, the first thing you do is say like, what, you know, uh -huh. are you kidding me? And, and uh, then you take a step back and, and she told me, she said, you know, I think you've got to get into her, meaning Dickinson's head more. Mm. And boy, that set me to thinking. And I think she was absolutely right. And, and what I realized was that I was writing a chapter 
where my definition of action was a rather conventional definition of action. Things happen, battles right. ensue, tannins go off, you know, that sort of thing. But when you're talking about Emily Dickinson, action is thought. Yeah. It's what she's thinking. And, yeah. and I think it's a you know, pretty important point to say that thinking is active. You know, it's a legitimate, it's a legitimate uh, occupation and um, uh, uh, occupation of one's mind. So that my, my discussion with our editor uh, made me read the letters in an entirely different way. I, I went kind of back to the beginning and instead of reading Dickinson's letters for what happened, mm -hmm. she saw so-and-so this person came to call. I instead read them and asked myself, what is she thinking? Yes. And then, you know, kept, kept track of that. So, so letters were enormously important. They can be read all sorts of ways, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, uh, um, but for the, the women that we're talking about who wrote letters, and I, I love your comment about, uh, thank, thank goodness she was apart from her second husband for a while, because mm -hmm. if you have all that, uh, uh, they, they really are the bedrock of, of our work. They are. In, in, I, I think of um, uh, biography often, or some biographies <laughs> anyway, um, or, or the biography I would like to write um, as, uh, as almost novelistic. I mean, we, have, we are dealing with facts, but we're also dealing with um, uh, the story. The story is, is not just what they did, but it's the consciousness of that character that drives a biography, a novel, uh, an essay. Um, and so, and if that consciousness, thought, whatever you want to say, um, is, is there to be tapped and it's there in the materials. Um, and of course we can speculate, we, we're allowed to do that as long as we let, let readers know we're doing it. <laughs> um, and you have a character who's alive on the page and, uh, and what a delight to do that. <laughs> it's fun. It really is the most fun, isn't it? <laughs> um, and was there anything that su really surprised you about Marjorie? Um, I guess I, I knew that she drank. I knew that she had an alcohol problem, but I didn't know how much it affected her life. And so I was surprised. I wasn't so surprised as I was just, um, oh, annoyed. Piss is the better word, you know, oh, Marge, put that Bacardi away, you know, um, uh, because she got into some car accidents by, you know, under the influence. Um, her doctors, though, I have to say, for the times, the 30s and 40s, um, little was known about alcoholism. And so uh, they would say, oh, your digestive problems are, uh, go ahead and drinking has nothing to do with it. And she was, she was physically fragile. She had digestive problems from an early age. Mm -hmm. And so it, it didn't, uh, drinking didn't help. Uh, so I was surprised and saddened that mm -hmm. her life so much and mm -hmm. that those around her did not, although she tried to, she was on and off the wagon. You know, she mm -hmm. knew, she mm -hmm. knew. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. so. yeah, I, I, I could also understand that, that sensation of saying straighten up, you know, <laughs> or talk, talk <laughs> to your characters because they live in our heads so, so largely. Um, yeah. uh, you know, Dickinson um, didn't ha always have the most charitable uh, or respectful response to immigrants. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there was a large Irish population. The family had Irish uh, 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 housekeepers. They figured very, very prominently. Uh, Margaret Maher in, in her life. Uh, Dickinson could be uh, short and reflected the the times, I think. Um, one thing that, that surprised me in a, in a delightful way was that she had a temper. And um, I mean, not, not shown very often, but uh, uh, she could be um, just not eager to see people at certain times. They, they, they drained her. She would close herself off up, upstairs in the room. What I particularly liked was when I, when I found a reference to the fact that when she really got angry, she slammed doors. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a reference in a letter from maybe one of her siblings, but I like that. I mean, it, it made it it right. made life, uh, you know, you, you have to do as they say, warts and all. And, and so you, um, you include that, you, you, you look for it. Sure. 
It's in, it yeah. makes it more interesting. More, much oh, more sure. textured. I yeah. think we just got the five minute warning from All someone. Right. <laughs> Are we to be questioned or um, people can write questions in the chat? Um, I don't know. Uh, Here we not. go. There you yes. are. <laughs> we have some audience questions for um, you both. Um, thank you for that wonderful conversation. Um, so the first question is from Donald, one of our viewers. Um, he asks, how did writing a biography change your sense of the person or the subject that you are writing about? Hmm. I, I guess we would have to start by saying, um, you know, how, how much we didn't know or how, how flat or um, how they weren't full, full characters until we got to know them. Um, I, I learned so much about Marjorie. How did, how did it change? I grew to, um, to admire her. I admired her so much, despite her, you know, her hangups, her, her uh, the drinking and so forth. I admired her tenacity and uh, she became sort of a role model, I, I would say. I just admired her dedication to her art. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, Martha, what do you say? Um, boy, you took the words right out of my mouth. I, I, I would say that I, I wasn't, it didn't change my perception as much as deepen my, my perception of, of Dickinson, my, my work on the, um, on the book. As I said, I, I studied and taught Dickinson for years and years and years prior to, to writing, but, um, it was that commitment to art, mm -hmm. uh, I think that that is what stays with me when I when I think about um, her her life in general. Um, I mentioned earlier that that uh, it's it's my belief that Dickinson didn't publish much during her lifetime because she found it difficult to let go of of a work. And there's evidence that she could return to a line years and years later and tweak it. Um, I, we didn't talk much about Dickinson's poetry tonight. That, that's a subject for a, uh, a whole nother session. But um, one of the things that, that uh, first time readers to Dickinson often find surprising if they look at a manuscript is that um, she didn't always make up her mind and she would stack one adjective on top of another or one word choice, one verb on top of another and did not circle and say, this is the one I want. But it just showed the mind that was constantly at work, constantly yeah. thinking about um, e expression. And that was a, a lifelong commitment. I think that's, that's what um, I, I, I was left with when thinking about those uh, overarching uh, themes in, in a subject slide. Yeah, good. All right, <clears throat> um, we have another question that kind of touches on what you both had spoken about um, earlier, just about maybe learning some things about your subjects that might have been frustrating to you, such as, Anne, you were talking about um, the alcohol <laughs> use. Um, <laughs> But another question from Judy, one of our um, audience members is, did your subject ever irritate you or disappoint you? And did you feel like you became friends with them after um, studying them or writing about them for so long? Mm. Martha, you want to go first? Uh, disappoint? No, never. <laughs> um, Anne talked about how, how she first came to um, uh, thinking about uh, Marjorie, Ac actually, and I, I mentioned that I, I, how I conceived of the book um, in my teaching, but I actually came across Dickinson when I was 16. And I read her for the first time at McClure High School in uh, suburban St. St. Louis. And it was her great poem, After Great Pain, A Formal Feeling Comes. And what happened to me at that moment of reading a tough poem and one that I don't know about I would assign to a 16 year old um, was that while I couldn't explain the poem I understood it mm. um, and so uh, uh, no never disappoints uh, uh, Dickinson is um, as one early biographer first said uh, he said she is inexhaustible and I I would have to agree um, uh, never never disappoint. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I got annoyed with Marjorie sometimes when, as I've said before, when she drank too much, uh, if she wasted some time 
um, I, I had to uh, address her racism when she got to Florida. Um, she he was a, a, a small community of black and white and the, the, the blacks were hired by the whites to do you know, the, the farm work and the, the housework. And she came to Florida with quite a, you know, a con conventional um, view of race in, in the early 30s. And, um, but the, what I admired about her on, on that subject was that she came around, I call it her come to Jesus moment, when she uh, met Zora Neale Hurston, she realized she had a literary equal, a human equal, and suddenly, Boy, the, the sky opened for her, and it took a couple of years. It's it's uh, thank God for those letters. It's documented in conversations with her husband, who at the time was overseas uh, in the war in India, and she made it a, a turnaround, a complete turnaround, and became um, a spokesman, a spokeswoman, an advocate for civil rights at a time when when that was not easy to do, and uh, so that was something I, I admired about her. When, when she did dumb things like, I don't know, <laughs> drink too much one night and, and, uh, and, and write a bad page, or so, I would simply say, and she was such a character to me, I said, oh, Marge, oh, Marge. And, and I would even sometimes text the archivist at the University of Florida, I'd say, guess what Marge did last night? You know, so she was funny. <laughs> oh, Marge, don't do that. Um, but but those, are, those are small things. I, uh, you know, <laughs> she was a, a very textured, it was a very textured life mm -hmm. as Emily's was. Mm -hmm. All right, um, this is our last question. Um, and uh, this is from Hannah, one of our audience members. And it kind of relates to what we've been speaking about, but um, as a biographer, do you think it's important when you're choosing a subject to choose someone that you ultimately like or agree with? Um, or would you rather pick someone who you think would make um, their, their story would come to life the best on the page? I am glad there are writers out there who write about the heads of crime families and, and, <laughs> and other un, un, unsavory uh, um, persons. I am not one of them. Um, and the reason for that is, as I said, not, not because that isn't important. I think that's very, very important. But um, people live in your head for a very long time. Uh, the subjects occupy your brain space. And I, I want to have somebody in my brain that I'm interested in deeply uh, that I find um, uh fascinating on day number 365 of working on something that that I, I did on, on on the first day and that that uplifts me um so I I don't know how uh those those other biographers do it uh but but for me I've, I've got to write uh somebody that that um that fascinates me and uh I we're not Maybe we should talk about next next projects, but I'm I'm just starting work on a, a biography of Dolly Parton and um, kind of a, a major switch from Emily Dickinson. But um, that's somebody who makes me happy, and and I I I want to spend days happily. So that that's how I choose subjects. That's a really good answer. You know, who do you want to live with for the next four or five years or however? Um, that, that person's gonna be your daily life. It's like someone in your living room and uh, if, if not in, in your head. And, and I feel the same way. Um, and, and, and another uh, impulse might be, and you might share this too, to, um, to bring to, to light um, a subject, um, a, a, a person who, who deserves it, <laughs> who, whose life would be interesting, has been notable, um, uh, would be interesting to other people and uh, who is, is notable enough to have a whole book, you know, mm -hmm. uh, written about them. And, and uh, in the case of us with, with, um, with Emily and Marjorie, we've, we've chosen uh, women whose lives were important. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that's an interest of mine as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, well, thank you both very much. Last thing I'll ask is where our audience members can find you on social media or your website platform um, where they can access more information about you. 
Well, thank, thank you. I have a, a website that I don't do the best job keeping up with, but it's uh, MarthaAckman.com. Um, you can also find me on Facebook, Martha Ackman Books, and Instagram and um, Twitter on Martha Ackman. And I also have a website, um, it's annemccutcheon.com, all, all run together. And, uh, and right now I'm keeping it um, pretty up to date because the book is pretty new. And so I, I keep, it, keep it going, um, but you know, time will tell if I'm gonna <laughs> be that religious about it in a year, but, but, uh, but there's that and you can contact me through, through that. And I'm also on Facebook, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Okay, well, thank you again, everyone, so much for joining us. Um, I'm Mary from the Tattered Cover here with Anne McCutcheon and Martha Ackman. You can order their books from tatteredcover.com. Thank you for shopping locally and keeping your money in your community. We wouldn't be here without you truly. So thank you all again, stay safe and happy reading. Thank you so much. Thank okay. you. Thank you both.